the first thing we're going to talk about is the need for a first hop redundancy protocol. So if you think about the uh, diagram you see on the right, and you see a very small picture of a data center, and in the center we have a server. Well, that server is theoretically serving important contact, uh, content for an enterprise. Whatever application you may be thinking of, it's serving important content. And whenever it wants to send data off of its uh, subnet, of course it has to send it through its default gateway. Well, that all seems obvious and everything, but what if there's only one default gateway? And if that default gateway should have a problem or for some reason become unreachable? That would not be a very good di design by any stretch of the imagination. So when we're designing a system that is going to have uh, important content to the enterprise, and you could think of that in terms of content that helps our enterprise to function, whether it's making money or some type of a public service, it's considered important. So what we want to do is design with redundancy. The design you see there does not have redundancy, so that would be a poor uh, design. So what we're going to want to do is to design with a redundant default gateway. And one of the things that these first hop redundancy protocols are going to do is help us to design in redundancy so that we don't have that single point of failure completely uh, debilitating anybody from getting to or from the server from disseminating content to our vital clientele because that's what we don't like, loss of business and loss of critical resources. Now, as I alluded to, there are three primary uh, types of redundancy protocols that we talk about. We talk about hot standby redundancy protocol, which is a Cisco proprietary protocol. Virtual router redundancy protocol. That is an industry standard. It's an open standard. And the third one in the subject matter, a gateway load balancing protocol. Now, so to speak specifically to HSRP and VRRP, typically in a typical implementation, HSRP or VRRP would have two routers um, acting redundantly for each other. They would have uh, layer two connectivity to each other. So what you see here, is an active router, router A, and a standby router, router B. And they both can talk to each other via switch one. So the, the dotted line you see here going to router B does not mean that there is not connectivity. It means it's not handling the responsibilities of the default gateway at this time. But there is definitely layer two connectivity because the two peers will send keep alives and will actually send conversation to each other. So they have to know each other is there. Now the way we do this is we use a virtual IP address and a virtual MAC address to provide redundancy in the event of an outage of either device. So one of the keys that we have to understand about virtual router redundancy protocol is the idea that there is not just a uh, redundant IP address, but m uh, very, very importantly, a redundant MAC address. So what we do uh, uh, when this comes up with VERP or HSRP is typically one router will assume the active mode, and it will process all traffic coming from uh, outside of the subnet going into the subnet. Okay, so this cloud represents traffic outside the subnet, and it would process data coming into that subnet. In the other direction, anything that these clients within that subnet need to send off of their subnet is going to go through, at this particular time, router A. Router A has taken over the duties of the default gateway for that subnet when he's in active mode. The alternate is in standby mode, which means very specifically he is not processing any data destined to that subnet or from that subnet to the rest of the world. Now, let's be clear about what happens when a host tries to send data off of its subnet. 
it's very, very common for people to understand that, oh, a PC or a host, a server, whatever, is going to send data which it's not sending on, onto a, a, a fellow client on its own subnet. It's going to send it to its default gateway. But what tends to be a, a fundamental lesson that, that did not get passed along very efficiently, I have found over the years, is that when the, the host is trying to send something to its default gateway, it is not sending it to the IP address of its default gateway. I've heard a lot about this particular misunderstanding over the years. So in this particular case, if PC1, whose IP address is 10.1.1.100, if he's trying to send something, and you'll notice the subnet mask is a slash 24. If he's trying to send something off of his subnet, now you'll notice that there's a server here at 10.5.2.5. Okay? So if this PC is trying to send something to that server, it can see by its own IP stack, based on its IP address and subnet mask, that the address it's trying to reach is not on its subnet. So it forms an IP packet with source IP address 10.1.1.100, destination IP address 10.5.2.5 in this case. But it would also put a layer 2 header on this. This happens to be Ethernet. So it's going to put an Ethernet header on this frame. The source MAC address of this Ethernet header would be 002168981952. The destination MAC address is not going to be either of these two physical addresses. It's going to be the MAC address of its default gateway. Well, when we're using a first hop redundancy protocol like VRRP or HSRP, VERP configuration or HSRP configuration is going to hold the IP address of the default gateway. In this case, the IP address of the default ga gateway is going to be 10.1.1.100. So we will have configured both router A and router B as peers in the HSRP or VERP configuration. And we would have configured the IP address within that HSRP or VRRP configuration. That IP address being the default gateway of 10.1.1.1. The protocol, whether it's HSRP or VRRP, will create a virtual MAC address. Okay? It will create the MAC address to be used as the default gateway's MAC address. So when the PC wants to send something off of its subnet, it's going to send the frame, the, the layer 2 header, will have his own MAC address as the source. But it needs to have the destination MAC address of the default gateway, which in this particular case is virtual. Okay? So what he will do is, um, as a matter of standard, what's going to happen is the... Um, PC, the host, we use address resolution protocol and send out a message on his subnet that says, who owns 10.1.1.1, address resolution protocol. The active default gateway, the HSRP or VRRP active, will respond, and he will respond with source MAC address of the virtual MAC address that the two of them use. So he would respond with 0000, 0, 0, 0, 0 c 0, 7 a, uh, alpha charlie 0, 05. Now the PC can put this in his ARP table, and whenever he wants to send something off of his subnet, he's going to send it with source MAC address himself, destination MAC address of this virtual MAC address. So then he simply uh, encapsulates the message. The switch will have learned where that virtual MAC address resides and will switch that packet to whichever router is acting as the active at this particular time. Okay? So each member of the router, 
uh, of the uh, HSRP group uh, is part of a redundancy group and has an assigned physical IP address on their interface facing this subnet. But they share, right, they share responsibility for the default gateway and uh, the um, default gateway's IP address, which is essentially a virtual IP address, and the virtual MAC address. And one of them will be handling that traffic at a time, while the other is on standby, making sure he's available in case something happens to the active. This is our redundancy. Okay, this is how we get the redundancy I spoke of. So just notice that they're showing down here the same thing we see up here. Router A has the IP address configured literally on the interface. Router B has another IP address on the same subnet configured on the interface. But they both have been told about the IP address of the default gateway. And then the protocol itself would have created the virtual MAC address. The protocol itself, as I said, the two devices can talk to each other. So the protocol itself will allow the two devices to decide which one is going to be active and which one is going to be passive at a given time. All right, so this is true in both HSRP and VRRP. Now, there are things we can do to deal with that. We can create preferences, um, or we don't have to. We have a lot of things we can do that. But the moral to the story is that one device will take over as active, one will take over as standby, and it's automated. 